In our evening services, we have a short slot, uh, which we call Sul Air, uh, which means a look at. Uh, it's Gaelic for a look at, and we take a look at something connected to uh, the work of the gospel, whether that's in our own congregation, or whether it's more widely uh, in uh, our island or in our nation, or whether it's connected to the global church. And every so often, we want to make sure that, that, that we remember the last of these, the global church that we are part of. That's one of the amazing things about being a Christian. It doesn't just connect us together as a local church family, whether that's in our congregation or the Church of Scotland beside us. It connects us to a worldwide family, a global church that Jesus is building. And so we are so excited and blessed to be part of that global church family. But one of the things that we must never forget is that the experience of um, different parts of that global church family is very different. Um, for us, we uh, enjoy many freedoms, many blessings, and many, um, uh, many s aspects of security that are just not there for so many of our brothers and sisters um, throughout the world. And it's very important that, that, that we regularly remember the fact that there are persecuted Christians and that there are people who, um, for whom being a Christian is very dangerous, very difficult, um, and yet they continue to follow Jesus. One of the charities that we partner with and that we've partnered with for many years is Steadfast Global. Uh, and so uh, what I want to do just for this evening, we do this from time to time, is just to share with you their weekly update. Uh, they send out this weekly update every Friday. If you don't receive it already, if you go to their website, steadfastglobal.org, uh, they will be able to, uh, uh, you'll be able to sign up there uh, if you want to receive updates. If you don't use the internet, if you're not online, you can receive a paper copy of their updates, which come out, uh, I think, quarterly. If anybody would like one, please just speak to me, and I'd be more than happy to let them know uh, that you should be added to their mailing list. I just wanted to go through um, uh, s uh, some of the headlines that they've shared uh, in the update, uh, just so that we're aware of, uh, of the things that are being faced by our brothers and sisters. Uh, throughout the world. I've forgotten my glasses, so I need to turn around because the writing on the back is too small. Um, they're asking us to pray for India, in particular for somebody who's been given the name John. It's not his real name, uh, but he uh, was uh, accosted by a mob of fundamentalist Hindus. Uh, although he was attacked, he wasn't badly injured, but he was um, beaten and humiliated and called to um, renounce Jesus. Um, <coughs> that must have been an, an incredibly difficult experience. For, for John to go through. Uh, and so we want to remember him, his family, and the thousands of others who'll face similar experiences. Nigeria is a place that's frequently highlighted by Church by Steadfast Global. Um, there's lots of tensions in that nation. <coughs> and um, you see here the awful news of uh, seven Christians uh, who were, were killed. Um, and uh, yeah, we just... It's really hard to imagine what that must be like. If seven of us were killed, I mean, I don't even want, it's just awful. So um, although it's far away, we don't want to, 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 to forget just how terrible that must be for these people and their families. Um, an update from Myanmar. Um, uh, a minister, Reverend Dr. M Dr. Hikalam Sampson, was detained as he sought to let leave the country. He's been uh, um, imprisoned, and he's uh, part of the reason for that is because he's been calling for freedom of religion uh, and an end to persecution. So uh, we want to pray for him as he's been in prison for his faith. Then last of all, we remember um, uh, Northern Cyprus uh, and we see positive news here where uh, the chap, uh, Ryan Keating here, uh, who had been uh, charged uh, with importing Christian literature, uh, these charges have been dropped. And so that's really encouraging and I'm sure that's a huge answer to prayer for him, for his church and for his family. And so these are all just really helpful reminders for us of the kind of challenges being faced by Christians uh, throughout the world. Um, and in a few moments um, after our reading, uh, we'll be praying for these situations. And I think that's such an important thing for us to do, not just tonight, but in the days um, and uh, weeks ahead, uh, maybe even every day to always have just a wee space in your prayer time uh, for Christians who are persecuted. So. Um, uh, um, it's great. I really appreciate, I know many of you do pray for them, and so thank you for that very much, but we can keep praying for them all and for the work that Steadfast Global do. Steadfast Global is based in Stornoway. Their primary worker is Malcolm McLeod, 
who's visited us several times and he does a wonderful work supporting persecuted Christians. Before we pray, we're going to have our Bible reading and uh, Dole is going to come up and read for us. Dole is one of our elders and he will be reading Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, even evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, after the image of its creator. Here there is, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ Rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Thank you very much indeed, Dole. Let's pray together again. Father, we thank you that uh, we have your word open before us, and we thank you that we are able to meet freely and safely as we gather to worship and as we look at your word together. We pray, Father, um, that um, you would help our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world who do not have this kind of freedom. And as we saw in our, our re update a moment ago from Steadfast Global, we, we see just four examples of, of the many, many places and the many ways in which Christians are persecuted for their faith. We want to pray for the church in India. We think of John and the humiliation he suffered. We pray for him um, and for his family, for his church, for others facing, um, facing these kind of difficulties in, in India. We pray for Nigeria and we know that there's been a lot of difficulty in that nation for a long time and we pray for the families and friends of those who lost their lives. We pray for those who um, committed those crimes as well. Uh, we pray, Father, just for healing and restoration above all that people would look to you. We pray for Myanmar um, and we pray for that nation. We pray for uh, those who uh, who love you and who seek you in that nation. And uh, uh, as we were reading about the, the, the man who's been imprisoned for campaigning for freedom of religion, we pray for, for him and ask that you'd help him and, and others um, uh, who suffer for their faith in, in that nation and in other parts of the Far East. Uh, and we just pray, Father, for, uh, for all these situations where we have people um, uh, just persecuted for their faith, people uh, in danger, uh, people who are exposed and um, and vulnerable. We also thank you for positive news. We thank you for the good news in 
North Cyprus that, that the charges against Ryan uh, were dropped and uh, we, we thank you for that and we thank you for other encouragements seen and we thank you that you are the God who hears and answers prayer and so we just want to pray for all these situations um, and we thank you for the work of Steadfast Global for Malcolm McLeod and those who he partners with we pray that that work would thrive um, and we pray that we would always be mindful of those who are persecuted for their faith um, we pray uh, that you would just be really near to them and help them we also want to pray for the work of the gospel in our own nation and indeed in our own community here and we pray father um, just pray again that we would see people come to faith in you and we pray especially that you would take away whatever hurdles um, might be standing between people and uh, and jesus whether that's doubts about their own unworthiness maybe whether it's a lack of assurance whether it's um a feeling of being hurt or, or or whether it's questions about um your existence or anything like that or or whether it's uh, just um a feeling of, of of people just sort of giving up in a way whatever we don't know but whatever it is father please take away these hurdles and help people to come to trust in Jesus. That's what we long to see, and we pray that you would just draw men and women to come to know you, young and old, whatever background, whatever circumstances. Uh, the gospel is, is what we all need. And for everybody here tonight, we thank you so much that we can be here, for everyone who's online. As anyone he if anyone's here with particular needs, concerns, or worries, we pray that you would be really near to them, that um, they would hear your voice speaking in, to them tonight, that they'd be comforted and helped by you. We thank you for your word and just for the amazing uh, way in which you speak to us through your word. And help us uh, as we turn to your word shortly to hear your voice. And may we grow in our faith, in our love for you, and may we be led by you in every part of our lives. So thank you so much for being so good to us, Father. Please bless us and be at work among us. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, before uh, we turn uh, to, to God's word together, we're going to sing again. Uh, this time our singing is from Psalm 108, and we're singing from the Sing Psalms version from the beginning. Uh, Psalm 108, uh, singing from the beginning. O Lord my God, my heart is steadfast, and with all my soul I'll sing. Murdo will lead us and we'll stand and sing together. Oh Lord God, my heart is steadfast and with all my soul I'll sing Heart by lyre I will awaken and my song the dawn will bring Lord my God, among the nations I will ever give you praise Well, for a few moments tonight, uh, let's turn back together to the passage that, uh, that Dole read for us. Uh, and we're going to read again at verse 16, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, where we have the words, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, tonight's sermon is a little bit different to what we would normally do, uh, and the reason for that is because those of you who are here this morning will know that uh, we, uh, as a, a group of elders, 
have taken the decision uh, to move uh, from uh, uh, what we call exclusive Samadhi to what we call inclusive Samadhi. Uh, now, these are two positions uh, which shape how we worship in our church services. And the Free Church of Scotland um, uh, recognises these two positions uh, and congregations have uh, the, the choice as to which one they want to follow. Um, uh, we, for many years, have followed exclusive Samadhi, um, which is what you've seen tonight, singing the Psalms unaccompanied. Um, inclusive Samadhi is where this continues. You continue to sing Psalms, but Psalms are accompanied uh, with hymns, spiritual songs, and uh, musical accompaniment. Uh, and we've, we've made this decision uh, as elders after many months of discussion and prayer. And uh, we, we, we reached the point where, where we've, we've, we've made this decision by a clear majority and uh, we'll be implementing it in our congregation bit by bit from next week onwards. I wanted to take the opportunity tonight um, just to talk a little bit about um, the basis uh, for our decision. This morning you received uh, an update which gave you an outline uh, of the reasons that we, we, we felt uh, were a biblical basis for this decision. And I'll just be going through these uh, with you together uh, this evening. So it's a little bit of a different uh, sermon tonight, um, but I hope it's still helpful uh, nevertheless as we think and talk about this together. Change is always a difficult thing uh, in any part of life, families, uh, individuals, whether that's your job, your home, uh, leaving school, change is always difficult. It's also true in a church setting. Change uh, is, is a difficult thing uh, and it's something that we want to handle uh, very, very carefully and sensitively. In regarding this position on worship, we are in the slightly, um, uh, I suppose, slightly unusual position whereby in our setting here in the islands, um, the, the majority position has been exclusive Samadhi. Um, and yet, it's the case that, that globally, that's actually the minority position. And in the free church, it's the minority position. Um, the majority of churches in our own denomination uh, have, have included hymns and music alongside the Psalms. And so we have this sort of slightly interesting situation where, where uh, you know, at one level, we feel like we're doing something very different by changing, but yet at the same time, um, we're actually, um, we're actually stepping in line with what really is the majority position uh, in our own denomination and worldwide. But regardless of these things, it's still uh, never easy to make change. And that's why we wanted to just take the opportunity tonight to talk about it a wee bit um, together. And the, the main thing that I want to do this evening is just to show you um, that, that we have based this decision on what we believe the Bible teaches. And that's the, that's the really important thing I want to emphasize, um, that, that our basis for this position is that we think, we believe that it has a strong and clear biblical basis. Now, as I go through the, these things tonight and as we chat about it together, um, I... I don't actually want to persuade you if you don't agree. I'm not actually trying to persuade you. Um, that's not what I'm aiming to do. And, and we recognize that, that not everybody thinks the same on this issue. And that's okay. It's okay if we disagree. And, and, and I am not saying, oh, you must agree with everything that I'm saying on this. We're, I'm not trying to do that tonight. What I'm simply trying to do is to say, these are the reasons that, that we believe uh, the Bible presents as to why this is the right choice. Um, and I hope that, that, that in doing that, um, these, these things are clear to you, whether you agree or not, at least you can see, well, we're basing this decision on the Bible. I want to say one more introductory point, um, which has two sub points within it. Um, uh, and that's to emphasize what, what this decision is not. And there's a couple of things that I absolutely want to make clear, so clear. The first is, is that this, is not, uh, this decision is not about hymns versus psalms. And in absolutely no way are we saying we're going to stop singing psalms. 
For a start, we're not allowed to do that, but we would never want to do that. Psalms have been and will always be a massively important part of our worship. The Psalms are amazing. They are absolutely amazing. They speak of all the different experiences that life can bring, and and they've got such powerful expressions of praise and thanksgiving to God. They've got incredibly moving words of lament and questioning towards God, and they're full of beautiful prophecies pointing towards the Lord Jesus Christ. So Psalms are amazing, and we're not in any way saying that we don't like Psalms. We love and adore and cherish the Psalms, and we will keep on singing them. And I hope that in the months and years to come, our Psalm singing becomes the best that it has ever been. Psalms are such a massively important part uh, of uh, our worship um, and so we're, we're not in any way moving away from that. Second thing I want to emphasize and, and those of you who've read the paper will, will have, have seen me saying this already that this decision is also not about what we think is popular and the popular question is, is one well you know you never know what's popular or not sometimes doing one thing is popular sometimes not doing it doing the other thing is popular. Some churches have exclusive psalmody and they're thriving some churches have included hymns and music and they're thriving it's not about saying oh if we do this if we don't do this it's popular and and some might think oh well if we do change it'll be good some people might think if you change it'll be bad none of those things are actually what we base this decision on it's not about trying to be popular or anything like that it's it's based on what we believe the Bible is teaching regarding how God wants us to worship him. And that's the key thing that I want us to emphasize. We are trying to, to base it on scripture. And that's incredibly important because our worship every week is the most important thing that we do. When we start a new week on a Sunday and when we come together publicly to worship God the Father, in the name of God the Son and in the presence of God the Holy Spirit, that is the most important thing that we do every week. It is the biggest privilege that we have, that we can come together as a community, that collectively we can say, Jesus is our Lord. And we come and we offer our worship to God. We hear his voice speaking to us through his word. We're fed and nourished by him through his word and through the sacraments when we share these together. Worshipping is just, it's such an amazing thing to be able to do. And sometimes, you know, I look at my own life and I've, I've often lost sight of that. I've often come to church just maybe out of a sense of duty And I've often sometimes thought, oh, well, you know, I'll do that and then I'll get on with the rest of my week. And whenever I think like that, I'm forgetting just what an incredible thing it is to be able to come and worship God together. It's the single most important thing that we do. And for that reason, it's absolutely crucial that that when we come to worship God, we come in the way that he wants us to come. So we don't come to God and say, oh, this is what we like, so this is how we'll do it. No, we look at God's word and we, we, we strive to understand as best we can what God is saying to us about how he wants us to worship him. And that's the way that we come. So that's why, um, in many ways, that's why our services are, are really very simple and very straightforward. We haven't added all sorts of different things because we don't want to do that. We don't want to add our own ideas. We want to come uh, according to what God has taught in his word. And so for that reason, um, if we want to, 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 to move to a position where we do sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and we do use musical accompaniment, that must be based on, on a biblical um, foundation. And we believe that it is. And I want to just um, just outline some of the reasons of that together with you. First reason uh, is a broad one. It's recognizing the fact that God is our creator. God as our creator is one of the single most important 
doctrines of our theology. And it recognizes that everything that exists comes from him. And that's one of the amazing things about being a Christian, about knowing God, is that you can, you can study and examine any part of life and you can see the handiwork of God. So you go, um, you go in to, to, to look at science and you look at science at the molecular level and you start studying, you, you look at a microscope and you look down and you, you look at cells and you look at DNA and you look at all sorts of things like protein and all sorts of other things that I don't really understand, but what you see is amazing. And it's the handiwork of God. And then you put your microscope to one side and you take out a telescope and you look to the stars and the galaxies and all the incredible discoveries that we are making and you see the handiwork of God. You look at, at anatomy, you look at your own body, you see you see the fact that, that, that I can look at my hand and I can think, I want these fingers to wiggle, and they'll wiggle. And you look at the fact that, that I've got a wee cut on my leg there, and in a few days it'll have healed itself without me doing anything. Can't get my trouser back down now, sorry. <laughs> you look at, at, at the fact that we can think, the fact that we can communicate, that I can talk, you can understand, we can relate to one another, and that humanity can achieve so many incredible things. Two weeks ago, a week ago, I drove over the, the Queen's Ferry Crossing. Amazing, what an achievement. You see the fourth rail bridge, even more amazing. So many things that humanity has achieved. It's all the handiwork of God. It all comes from God. And of all the incredible things that comes from God, one of them is music. The beauty of melody, rhythm, harmony is the handiwork of God. And I remember once having to look into this uh, for a project I was doing with some school children, looking at how you take a note, say the note C, and it's got a certain frequency that it follows. And then you take the note E, which is part of the C chord, and it's got a higher frequency, but it matches at certain points. And then you take the note G, that is also part of that chord, and it's got an even higher signature, a higher frequency, but it also matches at certain points. And you're like, that's why those three notes sound so nice when you play them together. It all just lines up so perfectly. It is the handiwork of God. And we marvel at him, the creator of beauty, of music, of melody, of song. And scripture speaks about this. You've got this fascinating verse in, uh, verses in Job chapter 38, and it speaks about music accompanying God's creative work. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth, God says? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, who, or who stretched the line upon it, or on when, on what were its bases sunk, who, uh, or who laid its cornerstone. So he's talking all about the world being formed. He's saying to Job, who, were you there when I made the world? And then he says, it was when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You've got this image of music accompanying God's creative work. Later in the Bible, You've got this amazing description of the creation itself making music. I love, I've always loved this verse in Isaiah 55. It speaks of the mountains and the hills singing and the trees clapping their hands. The, the noise that we have in creation is reverberating praise up to God. And Psalm 96, you have the same thing. Um, uh, the trees of the forest singing for joy before the Lord. Now that's, I mean, at, at one level that's, that's figurative language, but at another level it's speaking of the fact that, that creation as God's creation is resounding back to him uh, in praise. And so it's reminding us that music is a key part of creation. In fact, music is one of the great evidences of the fact that, that the world we live in is not an accident. There's design, there's order, there's beauty. You can take three notes on the scale, the first note, the third note, the fifth note, you can play them together 
and it doesn't sound all clashy and horrible. It sounds beautiful. Because God has made it that way. And so if you are a lover of music, which I think everybody here will be, um, where does that come from? Is it an accident? Of course it's not. It's all the handiwork of God. He gave us music and he delights to receive our praise back to him in song and music together. Second thing I want us to think about is what we call biblical theology. Biblical theology is referring to the fact that, that the Bible starts in Genesis 1 with the creation of the world and it runs right through to Revelation 22 uh, which speaks about the new creation when God uh, will recreate the whole universe and restore things to the way that he wants them to be. And so biblical theology is speaking about how God's plan of salvation has been worked out all across the ages of history throughout the Bible. Now, that biblical theology is separated in the Bible into two eras, what we call the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Uh, also, uh, we would maybe more commonly talk about Old Testament or New Testament. It's okay, it doesn't matter which word you use. So there's a big separation in those two uh, areas. Uh, at the institution of the Old Covenant, you have creation here. So I'll just write that there. And then here you have new creation, which is coming in the future and what's described in Revelation. Now, the Bible gives us descriptions of worship across these different eras. In the Old Covenant period here, in the Old Testament period, um, there's absolutely crystal clear biblical uh, evidence that uh, there was both musical instruments used in the worship of God and that God was worshipped using the Psalms but also using more than just the Psalms. So here's just some examples. Psalm 33, sing to God a new song, play on the strings with loud shouts. Deuteronomy 31 speaks of a new song written for the people of Israel, which is recorded in the following chapter. And 2 Kings 3, 14 to 15, you have this fascinating incident with Elisha the prophet, who says, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. Now bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. So you've got this clear evidence that in this Old Testament period, worship of God involved psalms, songs alongside psalms, and the use of musical instruments. We also have biblical evidence for what this period looks like, the new creation, and we get that from the book of Revelation, which prophesies this uh, very powerfully. I'll just whisk forward a couple of slides. There's various examples of this that in the, the update I gave you, uh, I've just taken one for our sermon tonight. Revelation 14, one to three. Then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and the Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been re redeemed from the earth. Now, Revelation contains a lot of figurative language, and we looked at this a year or two ago, uh, and when, when you see numbers, when you see imagery, all of that is part of the genre of the book of Revelation, which uh, uses very figurative, very dramatic language to give uh, an indication of God's purposes, both as history unfolds and ultimately in the new creation when God comes and takes all his people to be with him forever. What these verses reveal um, within that figurative language is the fact that, that, that in heaven we will sing more than just psalms. There are new songs that will be sung, sung songs that praise and worship Jesus as the lamb who was slain. And that's the evidence for that, um, in my own view, is very, very strong that, that, that Revelation reveals that in the New Covenant era, we will sing more than just the Psalms, uh, we will, uh, and there will also be musical accompaniment to that singing. So what that means is if we go back to this slide, 
we've got very clear biblical evidence in the old covenant era that worship involves more than just psalms and musical instruments. There's very clear evidence that in the new creation, there is more than just psalms and there will be musical instruments. My own view and the view of, of those of us who felt this was the right decision to make is that there is no reason for us to conclude that it should be different in this section here. This is the era that we live in, the New Covenant era, the era of the New Testament and the Church, and there's nothing in Scripture to say that it should be different. There's nothing to say, oh no, for this part, you, you don't do what was in the Old Covenant and you don't do what will be in the New Creation. There's not, it's just not there. It just doesn't say that. And, and, and I, would, I would argue that, that that continuity between these things is extremely important in recognizing that God wants us to worship him with both psalms and with, with hymns and with music uh, to honor him. Moving on, um, this is just a very brief point. Um, uh, going back to the Psalms, similarly, there's um, just so many explicit commandments to sing to the Lord and uh, so many explicit commandments to use musical instruments. Psalm 150, which we'll sing at the end of the service, is uh, just such a clear example of that. And again, that, that's just such a strong clear biblical basis that God has commanded this. God wants this. This is what he expects of us. Moving forward into the New Testament, um, there's two uh, key verses that I want us to just mention. They are in Ephesians 5 and in Colossians 3, which we read uh, earlier. Ephesians 5, 18 to 20 says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Colossians 3.16 says something very similar. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, Looking at that, you think, well, that's it, straightforward, isn't it? It just says, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's just very straightforward. But it's not as straightforward as that, unfortunately, because there's differences of opinion as to how these verses should be understood. Some are of the view uh, that this phrase, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, is a collective term referring just to psalms. Uh, and so when, when it says psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, it's actually just referring to the psalms. Um, and these are different titles given to different types of psalm. And I fully respect that view that people have. Um, but my own position is that I wouldn't agree with it. Uh, I think instead the, there is stronger evidence to say that, that it says what, what it appears to be saying at first glance. That it's referring to the psalms that are crucial, but also they are complemented by hymns and spiritual songs um, and my reason for saying that is because the rest of the New Testament doesn't restrict these terms simply to the Psalms. And I think that's an incredibly important thing to recognize. So uh, let, me, let me emphasize it here. The, the word that's used for spiritual songs in Greek appears elsewhere in the New Testament. It appears in Revelation several times. So it's the word, spiritual songs is one word in Greek, um, I think it's the word ode, but I can't remember exactly. And it appears in several places. It appears here. They sang a new song in Revelation 5, 9. It appears here. Sang a new song before the throne. And it appears here, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. So same word gets used. Now here, here, and here, the word is not referring to Psalms. It's referring to different songs which are described before you there. And I think that's why it's very difficult to say, oh, no, 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 it, it, it only refers to Psalms when the rest of the New Testament doesn't do that. Again, I have full respect for, for those who would, who would take it differently, but just my own position and, and those of us who felt that this was the right decision for our, our congregation felt that this was a strong and important point for us to emphasize. 
You've been very patient, and I thank you very much for listening so well. I'm nearly there. I just want to go through another couple of important points uh, that I think are just helpful for us to think about. One is what is known as the regulative principle. Now, that's a big word. Regulative principle. This is uh, the, the framework that has been used in the Reformed Church for how we worship God. And basically what it means is that our worship of God is to be regulated by what God's Word teaches. In other words, we don't just make things up ourselves. We don't do what we like. We do what God's Word commands. And it's captured in this paragraph of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Westminster Confession of Faith is a summary of biblical teaching that as a church we subscribe to as an accurate reflection of what God's Word teaches. And one of the things it talks about is this regulative principle. You can see it just in the last few lines here that the acceptable way of worshipping God is instituted by himself and it's limited by his own revealed will so that he should not be worshipped according to the imaginations and devices of men or the suggestions of Satan or under any visible presentation or in any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scripture. Now, that's got a, two very important aspects to it. The regulative principle restricts us from adding something that's not in Scripture. However, the regulative principle also requires us to include everything that is in Scripture. Historically, and you'll have seen this in the update if you read it, a good example of this was the sacraments. So in the medieval Roman Catholic Church, and in fact onwards beyond the Reformation, there were seven sacraments recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. In the Reformation, five of these were rejected as sacraments and only two were recognized, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And the reason only two were recognized was because these are the only two clearly uh, set before us in the New Testament. And so the regulative principle said, it's not seven, it's two, because there's only two in Scripture. But the regulative principle also says it's not one and it's not zero. So we can't add two or three other things alongside baptism and the Lord's Supper. But at the same time, we can't just say, oh, we'll do baptism, but we're not going to bother with the Lord's Supper. Or in fact, we're not going to bother with either of them at all. The regulative principle tells us we must not include what's not in Scripture, but we must also include what is in Scripture. And that's very important for us when we think about worship because we, we absolutely want to make sure that we don't add things that are not warranted by Scripture. We must not do that. But at the same time, we must make sure that we don't restrict things in a way that Scripture doesn't do that. And it's particularly important when we think of music because if we are to say if we are going to go and look at the Psalms, look at all the commands to use musical instruments, and then say, but now we mustn't do that. We can only do that if the Bible says, don't do that, don't use musical instruments. And the Bible doesn't say that. There is no command in Scripture that music should be unaccompanied. Now that doesn't mean that it can't be accompanied, of course it can. There's plenty of times when you sing when there's no musical instruments available and we'll still do that many, many, many times in the months and years to come. But uh, it's very important that we don't impose a restriction that isn't actually there. Instead, we want to make sure that we allow God's word to shape what we are doing. A couple more things I want to say uh, and then we'll just wrap up. Um, it's also important that we recognize that you know, what we're doing with hymns and music actually ties in with what we do in the rest of our sermons, uh, our services. So when I pray, I don't read out a prayer from Scripture. I say my own prayer as I lead you in prayer. And it's the same in our prayer meeting when someone prays. They don't read a prayer. Even though Scripture's full of prayers, they don't read out a prayer. They say their prayer. When I preach a sermon, I don't read out a sermon from Scripture, even though there's loads of brilliant sermons in Scripture that I could just read out. I, I present the truth as I, as I try to, to teach it to you as best as I can. And even as I read the Bible, I don't read to you in Hebrew and Greek. Um, 
I would struggle to anyway, but, but even though the Bible was originally written in Hebrew and Greek, we rely on translators, whether that's those who've translated it into Gaelic or those who've translated it into English. And so in all these areas of our worship, we are benefiting from uh, what others have done, whether it's me or someone else leading in prayer, me or someone else preaching, or the fact that we're using the translation given to us uh, by those who've worked so hard to bring God's word into other languages. And, and one of the things we're trying to recognize is that, well, we, we think the same thing is appropriate in terms of how we worship. So instead of just saying you can only sing the Psalms, we're saying you can sing the Psalms, but we can also sing hymns that accurately reflect God's word. And that allows us to sing about the fullness of God's revelation. And it allows us to sing the name of Jesus. It allows us to sing about all that's been revealed to us in the Old Testament and the New. And in many ways, it's just bringing our singing into line with what we do in the rest of our service. Coupled to that is the fact that when we sing, we want to make sure that what we are singing is proclaiming God's word. And that's crucial. We're not going to sing songs that talk about whatever. We're not going to sing songs that teach about things that are different to the Bible. We're only going to sing songs that accurately reflect biblical teaching. And the truth is, songs are actually an incredibly powerful means for teaching us. Uh, if I go right back to the start, um, uh, it talks here in the verse that we have here, it talks about teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom as we sing. And so uh, God's word has got so much to teach us um, as we sing it together. And to give you an example of that, I wanted just to, to put up on the screen one of my favorite hymns written um, about 140 years ago, 150 years ago by a free church minister called Horatius Bonar. And the, it's a hymn that many of you will know. What I want us to recognize is that although this hymn was written by Horatius Bonar, it is actually saturated in God's word. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down thy weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. That immediately echoes Jesus' words in Matthew 11. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You go to verse 2. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water. Thirsty one, stoop down and drink and live. That's John 4. When Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, he said, Whoever drinks the water that I drink will never thirst again. I give living water. And verse 3, I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. That, in God's providence, was our passage this morning as we came to John chapter 8. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so although these words aren't taken word for word from scripture, they are absolutely conveying the truth of God's word. And we're actually singing to Jesus, thanking him for all these amazing realities. The fact that we can come to him and rest. The fact that he quenches our thirst. The fact that he brings light in a dark world. And then the last thing I want to say um, in terms of, of, of the reasons we've based it on is just a final important point to recognize that um, we, we, we have sung hymns for many, many years in our church, not in our services, but in fellowships, whether that's in the church or whether that's in homes. And that's something that's, 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 that all our congregations do. And uh, we read hymns, we sing them together, we benefit from them. And we've had this sort of situation where we've done that in everything except a church service. And in order to do that, we've, we've made this kind of division between what a church service should be and what everything else should be. And so we've had this situation where, you know, if it was before the benediction, it wouldn't be okay to sing Amazing Grace. But if it was afterwards, it would be. That just not. That just makes no sense. 
there is not a basis in Scripture for that kind of distinction. There's nowhere in Scripture where you will be able to make that kind of distinction. And I'm not saying that to sound harsh, but yeah, I feel very strongly about that. Worship is worship. When we're together, we are worshipping. And we can't make these kind of distinctions. So these are the reasons that we've, we've based our decision upon. As I said, I'm not asking you to agree with them. You don't have to agree with them. And I fully respect it if you don't. And, and if you want to chat about it, please do. If you have questions, if you're not sure, please, please ask me. That's okay. You know, it's, we, we, we fully, I have got so many friends who I love who are on either side of this position. I've got so many preachers who I love who are on either side of this position. That's okay. That's part of a church family. But I simply wanted to take this opportunity tonight to explain the biblical basis for the decisions that we've taken. Last thing I want to say is to ask probably one of the most important questions. How do we respond to this kind of thing? How do we respond? How do we react when a change is made? Well, I want to say three things uh, very briefly. One is we do, we respond to this with great care and respect. And we, we respect every viewpoint on this question. Our church family has people who, who, who are on either side of this decision and it's also full of people who are probably like, I don't really know. We respect all of these. We respect other congregations that haven't changed. We respect congregations who have changed. And we just have a deep care and respect towards one another. Um, there are going to be times in a church family when we don't agree on stuff. That does not stop us from respecting one another and helping one another. It's also important that we recognise, the second thing I want to say, that although change can be daunting, change is really positive and healthy. It's a good thing in the life of a congregation. And sometimes it takes a lot of courage to make changes. Changes can sometimes be costly. But a change that, that is based on what we believe the Bible is saying is a positive step for our congregation. Um, change can be difficult, especially when it means you know moving away from what we've grown up with. And... I can understand the question that gets asked. Where are forefathers wrong? You know, where are the people who came before us wrong? And, you know, and nobody wants to say yes. You know, nobody wants to say, you know, and, and it's a very, that's a very sensitive question because, you know, um, we're not trying to condemn people who've done things differently uh, and people for whom we owe such an enormous debt in terms of the church. I think to ask the question, where are our forefathers wrong, is, is the wrong question to ask. A better question is, were they perfect? And of course, the answer to that is no, in exactly the same way that we are not perfect. None of us are perfect. None of us have everything right. And because of that, we're always trying to examine ourselves whether it's in our individual lives as Christians or whether it's collectively as a congregation, we're always trying to, to, to think about how God's word should shape us. And if there are areas where we need to make changes, we want to make them those changes if they're going to bring us in line with God's word. And so we're not kind of setting ourselves against those who've come before us. We're just part of the same journey that they went on because, you know, they'd have changed things themselves. Um, 300 years ago, there wasn't a church in Carloway. So at some point, something massive changed, you know, and, and that's part of the life of the church. And it's good to recognize that change is a positive part of the life of the church. The last thing I want to say is this. There are differences of opinion about what verse 16 says. We looked at that already. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another 
with all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. There are differences of opinion on that. I've outlined my own opinion, but I fully respect it if you have a different opinion. There are no differences of opinion on these verses. And there is no question about what these verses mean. They say, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Whatever our view on verse 16, it can never, ever, ever be an excuse to ignore verses 12, 13, and 14. And so we go on together as a church family. We go into a new chapter together, and for some it'll be very exciting for some, it will be an adjustment. But this is the journey that we're on together. We do this together as a church family. And as we go on together, we will be supporting one another, bearing with one another, one another, helping one another. And one of the things that I am looking forward to and that I'm so excited about is that we will be able to stand together and we will be singing Jesus' name as a family. And the name Jesus is going to ring out in this building in song and in melody. And people are going to be able to come here and see that we love Jesus. And that's what we want more than anything. Amen. Father, we thank you so much that we've had this chance to chat through these things together tonight. We are conscious that change is difficult and we pray that in it all you would help us and that more than anything we would be bound together with that compassion that kindness that humility that meekness that patience that you've commanded in your word that we would bear with one another support one another and that even if our opinions are different on on this or other questions that our love for one another would get deeper and deeper every week and so we pray that you would guide us and help us thank you for everyone here thank you for such a wonderful church family thank you just for the amazing blessing of being on this journey together and we pray that you'd lead and guide us uh, so that we would serve you that we would love you that we would love others and that we'd be able to reach out with the good news in all that we do in jesus name we pray amen Thank you so much for just for allowing me to do that. Thank you for listening so patiently. Um, we're going to conclude singing together from Psalm 150. These are just magnificent words of praise. Just, it's just like an overflow of praise, praise, praise to God. Um, and this is a psalm that we can sing with so much thanksgiving, recognizing what a good and glorious God we have. So murder will lead us and we'll stand and sing together. Praise ye the Lord God's praise within his sanctuary raise unto him in the firmament of his power give ye praise. Be Oh, so-
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and all God's people say, Amen. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's been so lovely to have you with us, and we really appreciate uh, your support. We've got tea and coffee served from the hatch at the back, and we'd absolutely love for you to stay behind. Uh, we can have a cup of tea and a chat together. It would be lovely to have that time together. I hope you all have a wonderful week. May you know God's presence and strength and blessing. In